Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Lucas. I'm an artist coordinator here at Darker the Dot, which is a supported platform created by artist Lauren Little for emerging artists, typically those who are at the start of their journey. Lauren is also joining us today and is ready to communicate with you in the chat area if you have any questions for us or today's special guest. So I'm not sure where you're all joining us from, but I'm very excited to be with you all as we chat with Chloe Russell about everything you need to know when applying for art school. For many years, Chloe has run a highly successful foundation diploma in art and design at Hartford Regional College. So without any further ado, I'll let Chloe take the floor. Hi everyone, um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, so as Luke said, my name is Chloe um, and I am essentially a teacher and uh, an artist. And my specialism is very much in helping students to essentially get into the best art schools. Um, so for a long time, I've run the foundation diploma in art and design. Some of you might actually be studying the foundation diploma. Um, some of you might be thinking about going into it, but that's really where I come from. Um, and that's my sort of area of expertise. And if you don't already know, the foundation diploma is basically a one year course that bridges the gap between A levels and university. Um, but I imagine that a lot of you have either, you know, you're either on a course like that right now, or you might be thinking about doing that. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit more information about that later. So that's just a little bit of background about me. Um, the other thing I would say, um, just as an additional thing is have a notebook that you can take some notes in or make some notes on your phone. Um, we always think that we're going to remember everything, but we don't. Um, and I'll be honest, there's actually quite a lot of information that I want to get through with you today. Um, so some parts I will be sort of skimming over in the presentation. So you will want to be making notes. Um, but yeah, so I've covered this a little bit already. Um, but this just gives you a little bit of background about me. Um, and as I said, I essentially support students in getting them into the best art schools. And by the best, I mean the art schools that they really want to get into. So it's not necessarily the most prestigious ones, um, although I have experience with getting students into the most sought after and the most competitive ones like UAL, Goldsmiths and, um, you know, other ones like that. Um, and what we're going to be looking at today, I've, I've sort of broken it down into five areas um, we're not going to be looking at them all in the same amount of weight because we just don't have the time to so we're going to be looking at very briefly looking at choosing and applying um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail with UCAS or anything like that um, because that stuff you tend to be kind of guided through with the um, you know the school or the college that you're in um, but I am going to talk to you a little bit about how to choose the right art school which is often where people kind of start with um, and kind of already feel overwhelmed and don't know kind of what they're going to do and what they're going to study. So we're going to look a little bit at that. Then we're going to move on to the portfolio and the interview, which is by far the most important bit that, you know, I'm going to cover today because it's the stuff that people always ask me about. It's the stuff that people always feel really unsure about. Um, and this should hopefully give you a bit of a leg up because as I said, you know, if you're studying foundation diploma, A-levels, etc. you will get support from, you know, wherever you are. Um, but I'm hoping that my little kind of tips and tricks are going to help you just, I suppose, just kind of get the best out of your work and get the best out of yourself. Um, and then we're just going to briefly at the end, look at sort of what happens after you get um, your uh, acceptances and things like that, um, how to do student finance and all that stuff very briefly. Okay. So, We'll start with choosing an art school. Choosing an art school can be really tricky because there are so many art schools that have such an amazing reputation um, and quite rightly so, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, they will be suitable for everybody. Um, I always say it's different horses for different courses and, you know, places like UAL, like Central St. Martins, for example, they are the ones that I, I get asked about as a, you know, they're like the number one places that I get asked about how do I get into that you know how, how do I get into that university um what's it like but I can't really answer those things the best thing you can do is go to open days um I cannot stress this enough I know that it's you know there's obviously a financial <laughs> implication of traveling to all of these different universities but if you are able to go to as many as you can um the booking tends to open for these sort of August time um and most of the open days happen over the autumn term. So between kind of September and December. So try and book as many as you possibly can. Um, they are the absolute best way of understanding 
not only whether the course is right, but also whether the university fits you. As I said, you know, some people will walk into a place and they immediately get the feeling that it's just not the right place for them. Um, and I always say to students that that initial gut feeling, you will pretty much know in the first five minutes of walking into a place, whether it's the right place for you to study. Um, and, you know, you really must listen to your gut on that. Uh, that being said, obviously, do your best to kind of take in as much information and research as you possibly can um, at these different places and be open to them. Some of them might have ideas that you are, you know, kind of unfamiliar with and ways of doing things that might initially make you think, oh, my God, I'm not used to that. Like, we don't do that at school. Um, but don't let that put you off because, you know, any university experience is going to be such a um, you know, it's going to be such a jump from what you're used to. Um, yeah, so make sure that you book up open days. I think the other thing to think about as well is think about whether you feel ready to go to university. Um, that's another thing that I get asked all the time is like, what if I, you know, what if I decide actually I don't really want to do the course? The best way to kind of protect yourself you know against that happening is to make sure that you do as much prep as possible so this kind of time of choosing the university choosing the course don't underestimate how much effort needs to be put into it um you really want to make sure that you get it right and in my opinion you know part of getting it right is to do a foundation diploma which I know sounds like I'm selling my own course but there's a reason that I run the course and it's because it's just such an exceptionally good course to help you build your confidence, help you understand more about what your specialism is, because a lot of people think that they are, I don't know, a textile artist, but they might find that actually when they go and do a foundation, they try out all of these different things, that actually they're more of a fine artist that likes making wearable art, for example, and that's not the same. Um, so I'd really recommend that you really think about whether you feel ready, not just artistically, but you know it's a whole new way of life isn't it and it's it's extremely independent as well so you need to kind of be sure in your head that you're going to cope with the independence of uni as well because it really is incredibly independent um there will be no spoon feeding put it that way uh and and also depending on which university it is you'll get a varying degree of of tutor time where you actually see your tutor one-on-one -on -one. um you know that and as, as i said that that actually varies quite a lot between universities which is surprising you would think it would be kind of the same for all but it but it really isn't um and that brings me on to my little top tip now i've put some top tips <laughs> at the bottom um of some of the slides which are just things that i think are really important um try to speak to students that are already at the uni when you go to the open days i don't mean disappear off into the library and go and pester people that are working um you want to be kind of beelining for the students that are helping out at the open day and ask them questions you can ask them anything um it could even be simple things like what's the accommodation like but think about what you wouldn't be able to find out online um you know how much tutor time do you get do you you know what's this module like you can find out what the modules are online um do as much research as you can before you go in so that you've got some questions to ask. Um, and then another thing that I would just mention as well, think about the location um, where you're going to be going to uni, because that's very closely tied with looking at money. Um, I hate to talk about money because I think it sometimes puts people off when they realise how much it's going to cost. But believe me, for the vast majority of you, it's going to be an investment. And I think there's so much scaremongering in the art and design industry that, oh, my God, you're not going to get a job like it's a useless degree. I'm sure all of you have probably heard that at some point. I've, I know I've heard it. Um, but really, the vast majority of the time, it's not true. Um, and there are jobs there, but it just means that you have to work hard, you know, to, to actually find that work and, and to, to make your way. Um, but an important part to kind of consider is the location, because you will, most of you will apply for student finance um, and it's only a finite amount of money. Although the courses themselves are all roughly the same amount, um, it's the, you know, it's the day-to-day -day living and expenses that you need to think about. So for example, if you choose to go to uni in London and you can't stay with parents, for example, um, you are almost certainly going to have to find a part-time job in addition to your student finance application um, to basically fund your living 
um, you know, pay your rent, pay your bills, and even things like travel. You know, a lot of the halls are not are not actually near the campus. You have to travel to get to them. So that's not me saying don't go to London, um, but it's something to consider if it's a lifestyle that you that you want. Um, you know, whereas other universities, let's say uh, in Canterbury, where I went, it's quite cheap. Um, and it, it's a trade off, isn't it? Because there's not as much going on there. Um, so you need to really consider kind of how you're going to sustain yourself. Um, and yeah, whether the, the location itself works for you. And that I would say just as a quick tip as well, when you go to open days, try and sort of after the open day itself, go and have a look around the city or, you know, um, just the surrounding area and just see if it feels like somewhere that you would like to live because often we think Manchester let's go to Manchester but actually you might not like you know the, the kind of fast-paced element of living in a city like that um, it's something that you really need to consider because you're there for three years so you want to get it right um, and those are really formative years of your life so yeah want to get it right so we're going to talk very briefly about applying. I've got loads of information on this side, I'm afraid. I had a look at it and I thought that looks really wordy, but it's stuff that you do need to know. Um, I'm not going to go into loads of detail about this, but in terms of applications, they all go through UCAS and the deadline is generally, well, I mean, it has been for the last however many years, January 15th, um, unless you're applying for Oxford or Cambridge. And if you are, maybe just let me know at the end in the Q&A and I can give you a bit more information about that. It's slightly different. Um, but you can apply afterwards, but the universities don't have to consider you. So please, 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 please get the application in before the 15th. You don't want that to be the reason that you haven't been considered. You would never forgive yourself. Um, so think about that. And also you do need to think about how competitive these universities are as well. Um, you don't necessarily want to use up all of your five choices, which is the amount that you're able to apply for on let's say one university that's really hard to get into. Um, because if you, God forbid, don't get in, then you're going to be kind of scuppered. Um, so do think about how competitive they are. I'd really advise you to have a range. Um, you know, definitely 100% go for the really prestigious competitive universities, but have some backups as well. Um, and I'd advise you also to make use of those five choices, even if you feel like actually there's only two I want to go to. Make use of the five. Um, you can always de decline them later. Personal statement, I'm not going to talk too much about. Um, the only thing I will say, though, is that students just really get worried about personal statements. Um, and I think that it's probably because it's it's a written task and a lot of academic people are worried about written tasks for different reasons. Um, but I want to emphasize that if you were studying science, for example, the personal statement is your only opportunity to show the university who you are um, and essentially make them think that you're good enough. Um, whereas with art and design, you're gonna be interviewed and they're gonna see a portfolio. So from my experience, the interviewers and the people that look at your applications are not, the weight isn't so heavily on the personal statement. Still work hard on it, obviously, you want it to look good, but don't lose sleep over it. Um, and, you know, kind of don't overthink it because this is where, I see students start to trip up and say, actually, I don't think I can go to university because I can't even write this thing. Um, you know, don't let that put you off. It's it's a bit of a pain to do it. Um, but once you've got it done and you feel pleased with it, it's really it's quite a big milestone in the application. Um, so there are a few just quick tips that I would say speak to your careers advisor. They're the best person to help you. Um, they see personal statements all the time. Um, and also your tutors as well. Your art teachers will really, really help you. And also the UCAS app, uh, sorry, the UCAS website is amazing. It's got loads of resources on it. Um, so have a look at that as well when you come to doing uh, your uh, UCAS. And I'm sorry that I'm whizzing through this. It's just that we won't have enough time to cover everything. Um, and I won't talk too much about the references. But again, if you are applying through a college or a um, school, you will have your referee attached to you already. So you'll never see your reference. It will come from your teacher. They also give you a predicted grade on there, which you can ask what your predicted grade is, um, but you won't be able to see your reference, okay? If you are um, coming from a different route, so let's say you're not in education at the moment, um, you can absolutely just let me know at the end and I can tell you more about how the application works for you because obviously you won't have a reference um, attached to you. 
So I've whizzed through those. We're going to concentrate mainly on the portfolio now. And that's the thing that, as I said, most people really want to know about. Um, and this is where you're going to pick up loads of little tips and tricks and things that can make your portfolio just sparkle, which sounds a bit cringe. But yeah, that's what you want to do. You want to stand out. You want it to look exceptional, something that you can't look away from and really invites you in. So in this context, a portfolio is essentially a collection of your work. Um, it's used to give the interviewer at the university an idea of how you work um, and an idea of also kind of your skill level, but also lots of other things as well, which I'm going to talk to you about. In this context, a portfolio is broken down into three different subtypes. So you have a physical portfolio, which the vast majority of you will do. Um, and that's the one you take to your interview. You also have a digital portfolio, which is essentially the exact same thing, but it's in a digital format. So it's photographs of, of everything instead. Um, and you also have a mini portfolio, which not everybody will have to make. Same with the digital. Not everybody will do that. Um, but the mini portfolio is like a flavor of your work, which you tend to send before you um, go to a physical interview. So it kind of gives the university just an idea of how good you are. and then sounds bad but they they basically decide who's good enough to um, ask to interview so the portfolio and if you take notes or remember anything from this talk please let it be this bit where I've talked about the most important elements um, it's really important in the portfolio that it feels authentic to you we don't want to just see kind of generic run-of-the-mill artwork um, you know, we want to see things that feel really uh, closely linked to your interests and your style. Um, we want to see a mix of different things that aren't just one particular area or project. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. But it really shows the interviewer way more than just your practical skills. And I can't emphasize this enough. It, it shows the interviewer how willing you are to take risks with your work. It shows the interviewer how... Um, how bold you are in terms of your decisions. Um, it also shows the interviewer how self-directed you are. Um, you know, it, it kind of shows the interviewer how well you will cope in an independent kind of scenario um, where you're, you're, you've got to basically self-direct what you're doing. Um, so yeah, it, sh it shows way more than just, I can draw this or I can paint this, etc. So, as I said, this bit's really important. And please, if, if you remember anything, make it this bit, um, because this is really what they're looking for in terms of a portfolio. Um, and I haven't sort of been too specific about what this will look like because it's different for each course. So I'll explain more in a minute. But, you know, for example, risk taking, if you're going to do architecture, it's going to be very different to if you're going to do fine art, um, but we'll explain more in a second. So a wide and varied range of skills. This is vital. Um, now, this is something that when I say this to students, they look at me weird. Um, let's say that you were going to study fine art painting or hoping to. Um, if you are going to do painting I really wouldn't advise you just to have a portfolio full of painting you really want to show that you can do more than painting and I know that sounds strange and it sounds kind of like um counterintuitive because why would you use up pages for things that aren't painting but at this stage the interviewers don't want to see that you're a one-trick pony they want to see that you're open to doing lots of different things and actually seeing a painter work with clay is actually really fascinating and, and it can teach someone a lot about how you do things. Um, so don't underestimate, you know, your abilities in other areas um, without sounding kind of patronizing. You're not experts in that area yet. You know, when you finish university, you'd expect to see a portfolio that's chock full of one specific specialism. But right now, you're not specialists and that's why it's important to have a wide range of stuff that you can show um so within that you want to show work in progress um that's really important and again a lot of people especially those that have come from a levels feel really unsettled about that um showing things that are not polished and not finished um but that's so important and, and universities love that they love to see things that aren't finished yet because it it shows how you work it shows how you think um 
and it shows that you're willing for things to go in a different direction you know maybe something you hadn't planned um, so it's very important to show work in progress it's important to show that you can take risks with your work so you know you want to show not failures but happy accidents we talk about um you know things that didn't work out the way that you thought they did but have taught you something because that's really what learning is all about you have to fail in order to succeed at things um and some of us are you know myself included especially when I was in A-levels I was just desperate to do what I felt comfortable in I wanted to stay doing these little realistic drawings because I felt like I was good at that I was scared to fail at something else but I realized that there's really no learning happening in what I'm doing I'm restricting myself and I need to take risks and, and try things out if it fails nothing's happened apart from that I've learned something um so it's really important to show that you can take risks because at the end of the day the university can teach you skills you know they can teach you how to stretch a canvas they can they can teach you how to use photoshop but what they can't teach you is an ability to take risks is what you do um self-initiated work is really important as well you don't want to just show your project work um I would really advise you to even now start a personal sketchbook um, and kind of even if that just means that you just draw occasionally when you're out and about it shows that it's not just about kind of um, the academic achievement of of finishing an A level or finish, finishing whatever qualification um, that's really important as well. Research methods what I mean by that is um, very much not uh, artist <laughs> pages so you don't want to be kind of adding in like little printouts of Matisse or you know anything like that that's not what I mean what I mean is your primary research so it might be that you've gone on a walk you've seen an, I don't know, an abandoned building um you like the texture you like the color um and it might be that you take a photo that is research so those are the sort of things that you should include because it shows how you know this thought process started here and it fed into what I'm doing. Um, so it's important to show that too. You also definitely want to show drawing. Can't tell you how overlooked this is. Um, you know, obviously some courses, you know, they will require more drawing, but every single practice within art and design is centered around drawing. That's the, that's the origin of everything that we do. Um, even if it doesn't seem like it at times, being able to draw and that, I say that tentatively because you don't necessarily need to be able to draw realism. You just need to be able to use drawing as a tool to make or create things. So, you know, we really love to see like little rough sketches of things and where you're doing your working out, you know, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be polished drawings, although that's fantastic as well. So evidence of drawing is really important and probably the most overlooked thing in portfolios. Um, and that very much can be a make or break. So make sure that you do have uh, plenty of nice drawings in there. And when I say nice again, I mean, they can be rough. Um, digital skills, don't panic too much. If you're not someone that works in a digital way, that's fine but showing an initiative that you've tried is really good I actually really respect it when I look at someone's portfolio and they say look I had a go at procreate and I'm terrible at it um but I had a go and I really like that I think that's that's really positive because we can teach you how to use it um but the fact that you've had a go it, you know that that counts for quite a lot so even just having evidence of drawing skills sorry um digital skills is great um that being said some courses like animation you'll probably want to show quite a lot more and even graphic design you'll want to show quite a lot more too um emphasis on most recent work this is important because lots of students that i teach feel kind of unsettled about their foundation work um and they feel like it doesn't look as beautiful, whereas actually I can see that they've learned more by doing it, but they don't feel like it looks as good. Um, you know, their little sculpture that they've made out of like, I don't know, a, a Tesco bag that they've melted or something like that. They feel like that doesn't look as great as the painting that they made on A-levels. So often students really want to put all their A-level stuff in and forget about their most recent stuff. Um, it's absolutely up to you what you put in your portfolio. I'm not going to dictate what you put in. However, it doesn't always look great if you leave out big chunks of your kind of education life for me that's a bit of a red flag I'll be wondering why you've left it out um, and it sometimes can mean that you haven't well I suppose that you've pulled 
back a little bit in the last few years or like, well, more like last three months. Um, so do include your most recent stuff, even if it's not your favorite. And just a quickie as well, you might be asked to have a body of writing. Now, universities are notorious for just randomly saying, oh, um, by the way, we also need an essay uh, and you need to send it in tomorrow. You know, well, not tomorrow, that's an exaggeration, but short deadlines, um, probably not enough time for you to whack something together. So I would highly advise you to kind of have an essay or something like that, that you can just throw at them if you need to. Most of you, I imagine, have essays from the last three years, um, and that will be fine. Obviously, the more specialism, the specialised it is, the better. So if it's an art essay, that would be much better. But it, it's really to, to kind of show that, you know, you know how to write <laughs> and that you have basic English, basically. Um, just a quick top tip here. Please don't cram work onto the pages. It's not collage. You know, we don't want to just like put as much as possible on it, you know. We want to kind of let the work breathe, which I know sounds like a very poncy word, but you'll know what I mean when we look at the portfolio pages that I'm going to show you. Um, you want to give the work lots of white space because it's the only way that you can really take in what you're seeing. Um, and I would advise no more than four pieces of work on each slide. Now, the slides we're going to talk about in a second, um, and it leads me nicely onto this point, the composition is so vital in a presentation, uh, sorry, in a portfolio, you need to think very carefully about the curation of the work and how it all works together on a page. Um, we don't wanna just be shoving stuff together um, without any kind of thought or consideration. And also within that, it means that you need to make sure that your work is photographed professionally. Um, that doesn't mean that you need a professional photographer. It basically just means take a nice photo with your phone um, and make sure that it's edited. You would not believe the amount of photos that I've seen of people taking like beautiful photos of their work. And then they've got like a half eaten sandwich in the background. It's not good. We need to really, you know, be careful of kind of um, anything that's lingering in the background, make sure we crop things out. Just make sure that, you know, the photos look presentable, things you'd be proud to put on a website. Um, so that leads me on to the kind of question of slides. Now, when I talk about a slide, it can mean different things in the different portfolios. But what I'm talking about in this context is that a slide is basically a sheet of paper. Um, now, when we do physical portfolios, we basically mount all of the work onto bits of paper, um, which are, well, they can be A1 or A2. I'd highly advise A1. Don't go smaller than A2. Um, it doesn't really look very professional at this level. I would really advise A1, even if you do small work, because you're mounting the work, just means that you can see it a lot better. A2, you'll find that you're starting to cramp things down and having to scale down photos and you know, you might find that your prints are really sort of squashed on the page. It doesn't look quite as good, um, but it, it is your choice. And I would really advise A1. So when I'm talking about a slide, as I said, I'm talking about sheets that are making up that portfolio. Um, and most of the physical ones for university tend to be 20 to 30 slides or sheets. Um, Sketchbooks are additional, so don't photograph those and put them in. You want to take the sketchbooks with you to the interview. Not all of them, just one or two. Um, sometimes they don't even look at them, by the way, so don't be kind of upset if they don't, but, you know, make sure that you've got... And also what I would say as well, just another quick tip that I've remembered, I would really advise you just to put in some little post-it notes on the pages that you would like to talk about, because the vast majority of the time, when you're interviewed, they're quite not passive but they're quite casual so if they open it they'll just go to one that you've got highlighted and you obviously want to direct them to pages that you can talk about and that you're proud of um so bring your sketchbooks with you don't photograph them because it's sort of just wasting the slides you know because the work is separate um as i said show a range of processes and methods and the work in progress you can include final pieces and actually i would advise you to include a couple um but work in progress is more important. You know, try and get more of that in. Don't just focus on final pieces. Um, just a few little things just to make it look good. Don't write or add text to the sheets. Students do this all the time. I don't, I don't know where that's come from. I don't know if it's something that, that some schools do on A-level. I'm not sure. But um, 
don't write on the sheets because it doesn't look good. It just, it kind of detracts away from the work. And the idea is that the physical portfolio you're going to be talking about with, you know, with the person that's interviewing you. So there's no need to write on them. Um, that's slightly different for the digital one. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, where are we? So photograph 3D work. Don't try and take it all with you. This amazing piece that you can see in front of you was made by a student a couple of years ago. Um, and she was thinking that she might take that with her to her interview. And I can't tell you how much I panicked because I just thought that on the tube. I mean, it would be destroyed by the end of the day. So, um, you know, you definitely want to photograph things. And also, where are you going to put it? I mean, it's yeah, it's, it's going to be way too much hassle to bring 3D stuff. So photograph them. Any moving image, so animation or videos, I would put stills. So just like sort of print screen and put them into the portfolio and then have it ready on a tablet or a phone or whatever. So that if the interviewer says, oh, this is interesting, you can just get it out and just show them. Um, but if it's not sort of in there, they, they won't know you've got it. Oh, label a portfolio. This is um, the reason I say this is because I'm still living down this moment that I had when I went to one of my university interviews at a place that I will not mention the name of. Um, but I didn't put a label on my portfolio before I went and apparently everyone else did. Uh, but I didn't. And I was the only one. And it was just so incredibly embarrassing because I had to go around and try and ask someone for a sticker that didn't have that. Basically, it was horrible make sure you label your portfolio, put your full name on it. And if you have a student number that they've given you, put that on as well. Right. Now, I'm afraid I know I'm talking really quick, but um, I just want to make sure we cover everything. So we're going to talk a little bit about layouts. This is something I get asked all the time as well, because people don't really know what, like, what it's supposed to look like. Um, and if I were in front of you, I'd be physically showing you what it should look like. But I want you to just sort of use your imagination. Um, and I'm going to be showing you some slides next. I just want you to imagine that the screen in front of you is a big bit of paper. OK, um, and the things on it are photos, etc. So <clears throat> we're out of presentation mode now. This is a big piece of paper. Um, and this just, I'm just, I'm really showing you this to give you an idea of what it should look like. So imagine that these are just two large scale images printed out. Um, so think about the layouts. It's nice to have two portrait images next to each other. You can imagine that two landscape images wouldn't work nicely next to each other on a landscape sheet. Um, again, no text on the page. And think about the composition. If you've got two photos, you don't really want let's say it was two headshots you don't really want just one that's slightly different from the other have a headshot and then maybe have something that's more of a full body shot side profile that's just an example varying layouts so obviously the last one was two um this one is three so we've got a photograph imagine that the piece in the middle is an actual physical mono print that's mounted on the paper um, and then we've got a photo of an architectural model so you know you can see that all of these things are linked together they're not they weren't all created at the same time, but they're all they're all part of the same project and thought process. Um, and my other top tip, take this or leave this. You know, this might not work for everybody. If you're a perfectionist, you may not like this, but it's kind of an unwritten rule in the art world that it's quite nice to leave a bit of white space at the bottom because when you're viewing the page on the table, it just makes it easier to look at the work. It sounds strange, but it, the work feels really close to you if you do it kind of without that um but it's not I promise you it's not going to be you know make or break it's it's um it's optional but I always like to do it okay um imagine that this piece on the right is a textile sample um it was the best thing I could find to sort of <laughs> demonstrate that but you can actually include if you've got relatively flat pieces of work, obviously, it's not completely flat. Um, you can actually include those. You could double sided tape it in or even stitch it to the page um, so that you can take it out afterwards and keep it. But I would obviously not do a whole portfolio full of that because all the pages are going to be bent. But you could have something like this on the top, you know, so you can show actual physical things, too. Um, and again, we've got a fashion illustration. Imagine that's not a photo and it's an actual illustration and a photo just to kind of show you what it might look like. Um, and then just this one quickly, which looks a bit strange now. It looked better when it was smaller. Um, imagine that's a life drawing. When we do life drawing, it's often 
on big sheets of A1 and it's portrait, don't panic if you have things that are portrait. You know, the vast majority of the time, they're gonna be looking at things that are landscape. Um, but if you have just a few pieces that are not the right, right orientation, it's fine, just put them in. Don't start cutting them down and mounting them and trying to sort of make them look the right way up. It doesn't matter um, because they're gonna be kind of taking the pages um, out anyway. In fact, I'm not sure if I actually, ah, I missed that point out. Um, leave the sheets loose in the portfolio. That's really important. I'm glad I remembered to say it. So when you buy a portfolio case, you often get these plastic sort of wallet things in them. Take my advice, don't use them. Um, interviewers hate them because they basically sort of like skew the work. You can't really see the work quite as well. Um, just put all of the sheets in loose, which I know sounds kind of crazy. Some people are like, ah, I don't really want to do that. Um, but I would, I'd put them in loose and make sure that all the sheets are the same size as well. Okay, so I'm sorry I missed that before. Right, we're going to move on to digital now. And again, I'm not going to talk too long because I can see I'm just looking at the time. Um, the digital portfolio, it ranges in length. I've known students tell me that the university has asked for five images or five slides, which is nothing. And some of them have asked for 50. So you can see the scope there. Like, you know, it, it totally depends on what the university has asked for. If they haven't asked for a specific amount, go on the physical portfolio and do 20 to 30. Um, it's, they're not really asked for any more digital portfolios. I think, you know, obviously they were asked for a lot during the pandemic, but the vast sort of majority of universities have gone back to physical interviews. So you're most likely not going to be doing um, a, a digital, a digital interview, um, sorry, a digital portfolio. They are sometimes not even followed up by an interview sometimes you hand in the digital portfolio and they just say great you've got a place um i'm gonna just tongue-in-cheek say that would be a little bit of a worry for me um because really I, I would want the university to want to see my work and also it's not just about whether they want me like it's about whether i want to go there so you know take that take that what you will like you may be pleased actually that you haven't had an interview so it, as I said different horses for different courses but I would just be slightly kind of I don't know I'd, I'd want to be interviewed even if it was nerve-wracking at the time um again don't write captions on the slides unless you absolutely have to most of the time you're able to sort of um write things like that in notes if you're doing presentations you can just do it as like a an extra thing on the tech you know so that it's not on the actual slide it's separate um but some universities give you a portal so they give you sort of separate upload buttons for different jpegs so you know <laughs> there's no one size fits all with this and i think because it's been you know it's quite a recent thing not all universities are singing off the same hymn sheet with this and you get asked for different things um, if they haven't said anything, they'll want it on a presentation. Use Canva. This is what I've used for this presentation. It's really, really good. It's so easy and it's free. Um, but yeah, so if you've been given a portal, you'll have to upload each image individually. So find that out before you start making your presentation. Um, and just another quick tip, I would really advise you to, let's say that you do have to upload JPEGs. I would advise you to hop onto Photoshop create a whiteboard, you know, just like a white page and add more than one photo to it as if you were creating a physical slide. Um, the reason for that is you can sort of maximize the amount of work that you show the university. Um, when I've told students this before, they've been like, that's cheating. You can't do that. Um, but you can really, the reason that there's a limit is because, you know, these people don't want to be downloading 50 different images, you know, and, and having a look at them all, they kind of want to condense it. So the fact that you've got more than one image on a sheet, they're not going to be kind of, you know, annoyed about that. And it's kind of an unwritten rule that if you're clever, you'll do that anyway. The other thing as well, just to mention, don't cut it fine with deadlines. Every single year I have students in tears about this because they've left it to the last minute and then inevitably the tech crashes, they can't upload it. And as far as the university is concerned, they are not going to be very sympathetic because they'll think, you know, you really should have done it before. <laughs> so, um, yeah, make sure that you do be quite mindful of your deadlines and, and get it in at least, I would say, at least five hours or six hours before. 
Okay, mini one, I will just quickly skim over this because really it's just a, a small version of the digital portfolio. Um, but as I said, it, it sounds bad, but it's really to separate the wheat from the chaff. It's, it's because you get a lot of students that do A-levels and they just think, oh, art's easy. It's just finger painting. Oh, I'll just go and do that. It'll be easy. It'll be like an easy three years, um, which it's not, by the way. Um, and the reason that they kind of asked for a mini portfolio is to essentially see who's, you know, serious about it and who's who's actually passionate and wants to, to study this subject. And you'd be surprised, actually, how many people just don't even realise that they need to have a portfolio for an art course. Um, but yeah, so that's why it's there. But but to give you a little bit of reassurance, I've never, ever had a student that I've taught that has been rejected based on their mini portfolio. OK, so but obviously make it good. You don't want to just quickly rush it or anything like that. So we'll talk about the interview because I'm just aware that it's 10 to. Um, so I'm going to talk quite briefly about the interview and then we're going to do some kind of Q&A's and everything like that. Um, the interview is people really panic about it, which I completely understand. If you are anxious, it's probably like your worst nightmare. Um, but you have to kind of remember that actually it's not just about you kind of proving that you're amazing and that they should take you on. It's about kind of working out if it's right for you as well. It's very important that that you are happy with it and that you feel that it's the right place for you. And the interview is a really big part of that. Um, they're really informal. Honestly, folks, they're so informal. Um, it's nothing to panic about. It's not like a job interview where they're, you know, often trying to catch you out and um, there's like power dynamics. It's really not like that. It's usually just a really casual chat looking at your work. Um, and sometimes they do include a group element, which some people really panic about. But actually, you'd be surprised. They're quite enjoyable, the group, the group ones, because um, you get to kind of share ideas and stuff with other students. I've included here just a very quick run through of what a typical interview process looks like, because, as I said, to reduce anxiety, I think if you know a little bit more about what to expect, it can really help. Um, so a typical kind of, you know, this doesn't always happen, but this is a typical interview day. Um, you'd be greeted by interviewers and then you leave your portfolio in a room and then you're taken off on a tour um, and on the tour you will obviously get to kind of speak to existing students and see how everything works. But it's a time when the interviewers are going to be looking through your portfolio while you're not there, basically. So it's a bit of a decoy. Um, so that's why I make sure it's labelled before you go, basically, because you're going to leave it and disappear. Um, it will then be followed up by a group and or individual interview. Some do both. It's not so common. Um, most commonly, it's an individual one. But I'll just warn you, if you are applying for UAL, Central St. Martins, London College of Fashion, etc., they are really keen on group interviews. So be prepared for that, basically. Um, and your actual interview probably will just happen in a large room with other people being interviewed. So it's no like horrible clinical white box rooms. You know, it's quite casual, like I said. Um, some people are told on the day, me personally, when I interview students, I always tell them on the day because I think it's agonizing to wait. And if I know that I want them to come, I do. But it's it's not really kind of policy to have to do that. So some interviewers will, you know, they'll tell you some way. Don't be put off if they don't. Um, it's just kind of what some people do. Some people don't. Um, I won't talk too much about unconditional and conditional now because I'm going to mention it on the slide after this. Typical questions. Um, this is one you probably will want to screenshot. Um, I was a bit arm and arm about whether I would put this in, but I think it's important that you get a rough idea of the kind of things that are going to be asked. Um, you know, I don't want to give anyone an unfair advantage, but frankly, these are things you should probably be able to answer anyway. Um, it just gives you a bit of an idea of what to expect. There's not likely to be any weird questions like, oh, if you were a chocolate biscuit, what would you be? Um, you don't tend to get things like that. It, it, you know, it's very focused on the work. So one thing I would really make sure is that you understand what your subject area is. I know that sounds silly and, and I know that sounds patronising because the vast majority of you, I'm sure, will know exactly what you're studying. But you would be surprised that people, you know, they do go into their interviews and don't know what fine art is. Um, so make sure that you know what, what the course is that you're going to be studying. Um, and just think about your answers to these questions. Again, um, I'll mention at the end, but 
I, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning, but I'm, I'm a private tutor as well. So I work with students, um, guiding them through this whole process on a more individual basis. Um, there is a fee to it, but if it's something that you are particularly you feel not a lot of um, you need a lot of support with I can do these things with you so I do things like mock interviews with you um, and more one-on-one -on -one portfolio development but we'll talk about that at the end so those are some questions that you might be asked you might not be asked um, and if you're worried about nerves I would really advise you to just like pause and breathe which I know sounds a bit cliche but actually just pausing for a second or two although it feels like a long time to you it's actually not at all no one would even notice most of the time but it can be a, it can be the difference between answering really well and not um so you know it's okay to breathe and also I would say I used to be such a nervous person I was awful at things like this and I used to just become so anxious I was sick on the morning of like interviews and things like that but I learned to manage it by being quite upfront about it so if I went to an interview and I felt the nerves overcoming me I would basically say um, I feel really nervous right now and I can't think and I just have a moment and actually the interviewers they're normal people they will help you break the ice um, you know they're there to support you they're not just going to watch you struggle um, so sometimes just being open and honest is the best thing but don't allow your nerves to let you start saying things like I don't know because that's probably the worst thing you could say in an interview. Um, if you don't know, what can be quite a helpful trick is to redirect the question. So if you are asked, um, I don't know, but you might be asked like, what recent exhibitions have you seen? Um, you might just be like, I can't even think of the name of the person I went to. You might say, well, actually um, it's not recent, but I saw X, Y, Z three years ago. Do you see what I mean? So you can redirect it to kind of answer the question that you want to answer that's not to say dodge every question but that's a useful trick that you can um use All right very quickly um this is my last slide you'll be pleased to know because i've spoken so much and i'm sure it's a lot of information to take in um accepting offers so when you get your acceptances or you know possibly even some declines um you have to have all of you have to have basically heard back from all of the universities before you can make firm and insurance choices. I just wanted to say very, very quickly, um, be careful of things like unconditional offers because where you've got an unconditional offer, they're basically saying, we want you, you've got everything you need already. You don't need to get a merit, you don't need to get a pass, you don't need to get an A or whatever. Um, and if you make them your first choice, you've essentially signaled to the university that you're coming. So it's very difficult later to change to another university. So most of the time, though, it tends to be that people really want to go to the ones that are conditional because they tend to be better universities. Um, not all the time, though. Don't feel like if you've got all unconditional offers that the universities aren't good. It might just be that you're that good. Um, student finance tends to happen around May time, April, May. Um, you, as long as you've done it six weeks before you start, you should have your money in time. Um, again, I'm not going to cover loads of it now, but again, if you want to contact me separately, uh, my website, I think, is in the chat and um, we can always talk about it. And frankly, you know, if you just want to DM me on Instagram, I'm not going to charge you for <laughs> a chat like that. So do feel free to just ask me questions and things about these things later on. Um, accommodation is important. They're really sought after. People go crazy um, at accommodation times when that opens up. So make sure that you kind of research the accommodation before, yeah, be before you've even basically decided you want to go to that uni. Um, because as soon as you accept and make your firm choice, that's usually when you get the interview, uh, sorry, the email to say, this is the accommodation, which one do you want? Um, so don't leave it too long. And then also, I know Facebook is very 2011, but they do have a lot of groups on Facebook that help you connect with other people that are going to be doing that course. So it's quite good to sort of look into that if you feel like you're going alone and you want to make friends with people before you go. So I know that's a lot of info, <laughs> a lot of info, um, but that is the end of my kind of presentation part. Um, I'm going to hand back to Luke now, who's just going to kind of finalise things. And then after that, we're going to do the QA. So if you have a little think while Luke is talking to you about any questions that you have um, and I can answer them, but it's fine because I know that was a lot of information. So you might not have any questions after that. Um, but yeah, do do feel free to pop some in the chat. And thank you so much for listening to me. Oh my God, thank you so much. I mean, 
I definitely wish that I had that kind of information. <laughs> oh, I would. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a very, it's a really daunting time, like mm. time for unis and stuff. So that was really useful information. I mean, even oh, some of the stuff that you said during that, I was like, I don't think I did that. But <laughs> I still got to where I am now. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, wow. everything I've said, you know, don't feel like you have to hit every box that I've talked about. I'm just giving you the best information I can, folks. I just, yeah, I just want to give you all the knowledge that I've kind of built up over, over my experience. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course, of course. I went to Central St. Martin, so and we had like a very similar like group kind of style of interview mm -hmm. and it was just, yeah. it was quite traumatic. <laughs> I mean, you do hear things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you hear that from all universities, though. You know, you, you hear such such a wide range of things. Some people go to UAL interviews and they're like, oh, my God, they were so welcoming. And, and you know, the vast majority of people in any university are. So don't be put off, anyone. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, th thanks, Chloe. And that was, again, very useful. And uh, if you found any of the talk helpful and inspiring, then please follow Chloe and show them some love on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And make sure there's a link left in the chat. Yeah. And if you want to continue doing these free art talks and keep up to date on everything that we have going on, then please subscribe to our neat weekly newsletter. And don't forget to follow us on social media platforms all to see what we're up to. Everything from exhibitions to events. So be sure not to miss out. We do have another art talk event coming up where we'll sit down with Yoke Amisan to talk about life after graduating from art school to so the other end. <laughs> and you can register now via Zoom and Lauren can leave a link in the chat for that. So yeah, now we're going to open the floor up for some Q&A for Chloe. And then if you've got any questions for us, then please email us at hello at dot dot com. Yeah, so thank you so much. But yeah, if anyone does have questions, I am I am aware that I have thrown a lot of information at you, so you may just be digesting things. Um, but you know, if you, as I said, if you do have any questions in the future and you think, oh, I should have asked that, um, just contact me on Instagram. Um, I was <laughs> saying to Luke that I've just set up my Instagram, um, which is why it's very sparse. So I haven't been like blacklisted or anything. Um, I am a legitimate person. Um, that knows things so <laughs> yeah don't be put off by the fact that I don't have much going on there um I do look at it I do I am you know I'm building it up so if anyone does have questions and like I said you know I, I wouldn't charge you for you know a dm um but as I said if, if you feel that you need a lot more support with portfolios I do offer packages which are on my website which are essentially one-to-one -one zoom calls where we look at your portfolio together and I give you you know frankly quite critical tips um which should help you a little bit and um yeah I, I i hope that that would be helpful and i hope that it's been helpful to to listen to this today and um i'm just very grateful to dark yellow dot for having me and for everyone that's come no problem no problem oh, i've got a question so um, so, a portfolio a sketchbook drawings a requirement Yes. So with your online portfolio, your digital portfolio, you will still want to include a lot of sketchbook. And actually, that's a really good question, because obviously with a physical portfolio, you bring the sketchbooks with you. The only in fact, you're right, I should have actually put that in with the digital portfolio. That's the only thing you will want to do as an additional thing. You will definitely want to have some sketchbook pages in there. Um, I would very much select like nice double pages that always looks really good um, and kind of make sure that you are being mindful of what's written on the pages and things like that as well because sometimes we make amazing pages and then we look at what we've written it's just complete rubbish um, so don't just look at what they physically look like you want to be kind of impressing them with your language and you know your analysis of things and, and stuff like that so yes definitely um, and I would say based on let's say you were doing an online portfolio that's I don't know 20 slides long if that's how long they've asked as a guide I would say you probably want a fifth of that to be your sketchbook so that would be four pages or four slides okay um so yeah definitely do pop them in as well I think that draws us to a close brilliant thank you so much thank you so much for coming on this evening and again giving us very useful information and um yeah and thank you everybody for joining bye bye